So uh, my next presentation now is on single station fee <coughs> using mainly the NGA West 2 data and I am acting as a proponent expert. <laughs> so uh, I am going to talk briefly, give a background on, uh, on uh, single station uh, fee, uh, terminology used and the approach. I saw that Norm covered that earlier on so this will be brief. Then I'm going to show the results of the single station fee analysis using NGA West 2 residuals from Abrahamson et al, Campbell and Bosonia and Chu and Yangs, as well as using residuals from the Taiwan <coughs> data of the Lin et al paper. I'll show some observed trends with magnitude, distance, VS30, and some comparisons. And I will also, hopefully, if I have enough time cover some path effects and uh, regional variations and try to explain some of these things. Uh, so here, uh, this is the plot that you just saw before. So we have the total residual, uh, which is the misfit from the observed ground motion with respect to the GMPE uh, for an earthquake E at a station S. And this is usually divided into two components, between event residual, which is the average of the misfit for one earthquake, and uh, within event residual uh, for each recording for, for an earthquake, which is the misfit between uh, the recording at this particular station and the event-specific median. So uh, again, terminology delta BE is the between event residual that uh, used to be called, or sometimes is still called inter-event residual or event term. Delta WES is the within event residual or intra event residual uh, at station S for earthquake E. Now, if we look at uh, the standard deviations of the between event residuals, we have tau, between event standard deviation, and phi is the within event standard deviation, and when we combine them, we get sigma, total standard deviation. So when we talk about um, uh, partially removing um, the, erg the erg ergodic assumption, what we basically mean is uh, we if we have enough recordings of the ground motion at an individual station, we can estimate <coughs> the systematic side effects and remove them from the within event uh, um, residual, and this way we can get to single station fee. So this um, delta S to S term that we estimate represents the systematic deviation of the observed amplification at this site from the median amplification predicted by the model. So this here summarizes the terminology used. So we, I have from the different uh, models that I am analyzing, their within event um, uh, residuals. I estimate the site to site term, so this one does not include the event, ter uh, the event term in it. I estimate the site-to-site -side term. I take that out and I end up with single station within event residuals and then single station fee. And this is all what I'm talking about today. I'm not talking about tau. All right, so we start with um, the Abrahamson et al. residuals. Uh, if I choose a minimum of three recordings per station, uh, I end up uh, with uh, 13,000 recordings from the Abrahamson et al. Um, model, uh, 297 earthquakes and over 1,000 stations. Most of these uh, recordings come from California, and you can see here magnitude distance distribution. Some of the data is from Taiwan and fewer and fewer data from Japan, Italy, and China. So this is the uh, frequency of the recordings versus uh, VS30, and this is just the recordings that remain after I consider only a minimum of uh, three recordings per station. And you can see most of the data comes f from VS30 between 250 and 700 meters per second. Uh, this plot here shows uh, the number of recordings used per spectral uh, period, and you can see here that uh, the number of recordings drop after about uh, a period of one, and this is due to the minimum usable uh, frequency of the data. So let's see uh, the difference between the fee and the fee as uh, for the Abrahamson et al. Uh, residuals. In red here, you have the fee, 
uh, which is the ergodic fee, and in blue you have this uh, single station fee uh, for all the data uh, together, all the region groups together. And you can see here the uh, difference that you get after taking out the side-to-side -side term. Now if we want to look at uh, this plot region by region, you see here the triangles are the California data, so you have here the, the fee for California as a triangle. In blue, it's the fee SS for California. Then you have uh, the square, it's uh, the, the um, Japan data. This is their fee, and this is their fee SS. Now these stars are um, the Taiwan data, so fee for Taiwan is significantly lower than the rest of the data, and same thing for fee SS. So if we can also add Italy, which is the circles, and there is not that much data, so you can see that it has a, a big error. So if we look at VSS only here, um, to make it more clear, you see uh, the, uh, the VSS of all the data set. Then you have California, Japan, Italy, and Taiwan here. So I looked at the impact of uh, the, my minimum number of recordings on the results. So maybe three is uh, too little. Uh, I looked at using five and ten. So it's a trade-off between uh, how reliable is the uh, side term that I take out versus how much data I end up with. So for n min equal three, five, or ten, this is the California uh, fee SS, and actually doesn't change because there is so much data for California uh, that it's, it just doesn't matter. Uh, this is for Taiwan, uh, n min 3 and 5. If I take n min 10, I don't have any uh, Taiwanese data. And it also is, is OK either way. Um, this is for Italy, and it's not OK either way, so, <laughs> because there isn't that much data. Um, so from now on, I will show results for n min equal 3 in order to keep as much data as possible. So this is here a, a comparison of the VSS of the whole uh, data, all the regions together, using NMIN 3, 5, and 10. And you see 10 is, is slightly higher, but that's only because we don't have Taiwanese data anymore, which was bringing the, the VSS down, because it was significantly lower than the rest of the regions. OK, so let's look at some magnitude uh, dependence. You have here first plot PGA, period of one second. And this is VSS versus magnitude, uh, split up by regions. Uh, in blue, uh, the circles are uh, California. And you see it's uh, about constant up to magnitude 5. Then it drops. Then it goes slightly up again, and it goes constant. Uh, for Taiwan, and this is the stars in, in red, most of the data basically groups around three uh, uh, magnitude ranges. Uh, Italy. I'm uh, sorry, China is uh, these triangles, and, and there isn't a lot of data. And then we have um, Japan, it only groups in this magnitude range. Uh, for a period of uh, one second, um, again, this is California here in blue, and it, the, the, the VSS slightly increases and then decreases again uh, from magnitude 5 onwards. Now, uh, let's look at the, the magnitude and distance uh, dependence. So we group the data in different uh, magnitude bins and uh, distance bins. And this is PGA, California only. Uh, in blue is the magnitude 3 to 5, red is 5 to 6, and green is 6 to 8. <coughs> and one you know, obvious thing to notice here is how the VSS jumps up uh, for the small magnitude at short distance. Uh, this sort of behavior, I don't see it with a magnitude 5 to 6 and 6 to 8. This is the same sort of plot for Taiwan, but we only have magnitude 5 to 6 and 6 to 8. Um, I don't know if we can say much about it. This, this is the Japan, uh, and it's only magnitude 6 to 8. And this is here, uh, Italy, and we only have 5 to 6 and 6 to 8, and with a lot of um, error. Uh, these are the same plots at a period of one second. For California here, notice that we don't have this ramp up of the VSS with a small magnitude um, short distance. Uh, pretty much looks 
more or less constant. This is Taiwan here for a period of one second, uh, Japan, and then Italy. VS30 dependence, so I group the, the residuals in different VS30 bins, and we have California in blue, and it actually shows a little bit of an increase in VSS as, we, as VS30 increases. Um, this is for PGA, and then for one second, um, you know, it increases a little bit, then decreases again for California. Okay, uh, for the two and Young's um, for um, NJ West two residuals, I repeated the same analysis uh, using a minimum of three recordings per station. I get over nine thousand recordings, mainly from California, and few recordings, few hundred recordings from Japan. Uh, just to show their uh, fee and, and fee SS, uh, this is uh, their ergodic fee, and after taking out the site term, this is the fee SS that we get for their residuals. Now, uh, I'm showing the, um, the, the fee and fee SS for Northern California and Southern California, and it's kind of interesting to see that for fee, you see that some difference. In, in Northern versus Southern California, but when you take out the side term, they kind of collapse. And here adding the Japan uh, data, this is the fee for Japan, the, the squares, and this is in blue, the PSS for Japan. And I'll show more trends later on when I compare everything together. <laughs> for uh, Campbell and Bosonia, uh, using a minimum of three recordings per station, I have uh, over 5,000 recordings, and. I have the residuals up to 80 kilometers, and they're mainly from California. Uh, these are their fee and fee SS, and this, this is all the data, and the, and the, the um, triangles are California, California only. All right, so then I analyzed uh, the Lin et al. data, and this is mainly to try to understand why is the Taiwan fee SS smaller uh, than the California VSS when I look at uh, the Abramson et, et al. Uh, residuals. So I basically um, have the, the Lin et al. residuals for Taiwan, <coughs> and they have um, uh, basically uh, over 10 recordings per station in their data set, and I added to those whatever additional uh, residuals were in the Abramson et al. Uh, data set. So I have a total of about 5,300 recordings from 65 earthquakes at 362 uh, stations. And this is the fee and the fee SS that I get. Uh, fee SS is about 0.4. And again, it's also smaller than California. If you recall, it was about 0.5. All right, so now I, I, I'll compare all these uh, results uh, together and see where they are different. So looking at the, the three uh, NGOS2 models that I analyzed, this is VSS uh, for California, and it's, it agrees very well among all the models. This is VSS Japan for Chu and Young's uh, 13 and uh, Abrahamson uh, et al. And again, they, they kind of agree. And these are the Taiwan fee and fee, uh, I'm sorry, the Taiwan VSS using the Lin et al. data mainly with uh, the additional residuals from the Abrahamson et al. versus using only the Abrahamson uh, et al. residuals. So I'm sorry, this is Abrahamson et al. and this is Lin et al. So you see that the, the Lin et al. is slightly higher. Uh, for the Abrahamson et al. Uh, Taiwan data, they basically had uh, Chi Chi main shock and five aftershocks. So the, the Lin et al. has a lot more data. Um, Let's look at the magnitude dependence of all the models together. And we have, uh, I, I'm only showing California for the NGA West 2 models and also Taiwan from the Lin et al. Uh, so for the California NGA West 2 models, they kind of agree, uh, all the models in terms of the magnitude dependence. Taiwan is over here. It shows some trend, but it's smaller VSS. This is PGA. This is a period of one second. Uh, magnitude distance dependence, this is interesting here, you see magnitude 3 to 5, 5 to 6, 6 to 8 at PGA. And see here, all the NGA West 2 models have the same VSS and the same trend, basically high VSS for, uh, for small magnitude short period. 
the Taiwan, the Lenetal data shows also the same trend. However, the VSS starts dropping lower compared to the California data at larger distances. Um, the, for magnitude 5 and 6, uh, NGA West 2 models show similar VSS trend, same thing as Taiwan, and magnitude 6 to 8, kind of similar trend. This is period of one second. Now Taiwan agrees very well with uh, the California data. Uh, VS30 dependence, again, all NJ3 and JWS2 models showed the same trend of increased VSS with VS30 at PGA. This wasn't observed for the Taiwanese data. You can see it's more or less constant. This is PGA and this is one second here. So, uh, I, I think Adrian in the previous workshop gave a presentation about the uh, VSS models that were developed for the Pegasus refinement project. And this is here one of uh, the plots from, from their report. This shows phi, which is the ergodic within event standard deviation, uh, for the different regions uh, that, that they used. They had data from California, Switzerland, Taiwan, Turkey, Japan, but they had significantly less data than what we have now for NGOS2. And you can see here the trend, that basically, that there are regional dependence in phi. However, when they took out the site term, things looked uh, more stable. So one of the conclusions at the time is that there isn't uh, regional dependence, which isn't what I see now with the Taiwanese data. So at that time, they had uh, three VSS models. One is constant, one is distance dependent only, and one is magnitude and distance dependent. So I'm going to compare the California VSS to the constant and the MR dependent uh, VSS from the Pegasus refinement project. Uh, this here shows in, in red that this is the VSS versus period for California. Uh, and this is from the Abrahamson et al. data, but it's the same for all the other models. Uh, this line here is the mean uh, VSS uh, for the constant uh, PRP model, and then plus and minus uh, one sigma. And uh, right now it's, it appears that our California data is on the higher side compared to the mean of this model. If we look at, uh, compare again California uh, binned by magnitude and distance, and compare that to the uh, MR dependent uh, Pegasus refinement uh, project models. You see here uh, in blue solid line is the magnitude 4.5, in red is the magnitude 5.5, and in green is the magnitude 7. Uh, right now, we, I see stronger distance dependence here for California data than what, what was suggested in the Pegasus project. Uh, they also saw more of that distance dependence for the uh, middle magnitude range, magnitude 5 to 6, I don't really see that anymore. And it's more or less similar for the magnitude 6 and 7. Uh, at one second, they also had um, you know, this, this distance dependence. And with, the new, with the, the, now the California data, we can argue that maybe there isn't such distance dependence here at short distance. I don't know. So it's similar, but there are some differences. So observations is basically, right now, the main issues is VSS from this analysis does not necessarily appear to be region independent. So we clearly saw that, especially Taiwan, where we had a lot of data, well, enough data, had lower VSS. One thing I looked in the Linetal paper, and actually, also, another study, Chen and Tsai 2002, reported a low VSS2 for Taiwan. So, I don't, so there is clearly something going on there that ha, you know, they have a smaller VSS. So I looked into the effects of PATH on this uh, VSS, and I'll get into that in a minute. The other th thing that uh, we observe is this increase in VSS at small magnitude and short distance. And we want to try to understand why this is happening. Is it hypocentral location errors? Is it radiation pat pattern? And, and I also looked into that a little bit. This is all work in progress, but I'll show some, some things. So path effects. I 
Uh, one thing with the path effects is we can look at the closeness index as a proxy to see how uh, paths are similar. And this is you know, based on the Lenetal paper. So basically, if you have a station here that recorded uh, two earthquakes, uh, you can compute the closeness index for the path uh, from these two earthquakes to this station. And this is equal to the difference in the hypercentral location uh, divided by the sum of the uh, distances to the station divided by two. So what this says, basically, this CI can be a number from 0 to 2. If it's zero, it means that uh, the earthquakes are co-located, they have the same path. If it's two, it means that they are in opposite epicentral directions from the site. Um, so what I did is I tried to see uh, what would be the expected closeness index for randomly located earthquakes around the station. And I compared what is the average closeness index that comes from the data to that random one to see how much uh, you know, how, how random are the paths or how similar they are. So for the um, expected closeness index for randomly located earthquakes, I just generated a series of uh, randomly located earthquakes in a circular area around, um, around a station, I computed CI for each pair of earthquakes, calculated the mean CI, and repeated this for different number of earthquakes and different distances around the station to see if how stable this number is. And basically, this comes out to be about 1.38 CI. And here we go again, missing simple. <laughs> but that's CI. Um, so, so then it's about 1.38. 1, 1 uh, so I, let's look at the Northern California data. So if I, I compute the CI for all the Northern California um, uh, data in the Abrahamson et al. residuals, and I plot them here, I have on the vertical axis delta square, where delta, all what it is is that it's the normalized difference in the residuals, normalized by the VSS. Uh, so you, we can, one thing we can see is the, how the distribution of the, the closeness index, and it appears that a lot more is closer to two. Uh, one thing we can do here, and this is based on the Lin et al. Uh, paper, is we can compute um, the standard deviation. I can basically bin these delta squared in different closeness index bins and compute the standard deviation sigma. And this is what you see here with these data points. Uh, the solid line <coughs> is a, the model that was uh, proposed in the Lin et al for Taiwan data. What this means is that basically if your closeness index is zero, it means your, your paths are perfectly correlated, then you are here, and this would be, uh, will give you um, the single path sigma that is normalized in this case, because we're normalizing. If your closeness index is two, <coughs> meaning uh, your paths are not correlated at all, then this will give you uh, the single station sigma. This is one because it's normalized. And anywhere in between, it means you have some path uh, effects uh, that are being um, observed. So this green line, here, green uh, data point is the um, uh, closeness index for randomly located earthquakes, the 1.38. And if, if I average all these uh, closeness indexes here, I get 1.16. So basically what this tells me is there isn't much path effects for the, for the Northern California data. Same thing for the Southern California. The exact same uh, analysis, and I get um, a mean closeness index of 1.2. Linda, I think it's, yeah. it's not that there are no path effects for Northern California data, but the, the, the you don't have unusually um, repeated paths, right? Yeah, like they're not clustered. They're not clustered. Yeah. For the Taiwan data, and this is why we looked into these path effects, uh, this is, uh, you know, this also was done in the Lin et al. paper, so I repeated it, and it's the same exact thing. These are the closeness, closeness index and the delta squared, um, the normalized residual squared, and these are the, the sigma. And on average, the closeness index comes as 1.02. So it's not single path, at least. <laughs> so then I, I thought that 
where we observe this lower uh, VSS for Taiwan is for uh, magnitude 3 to 5 at longer distance. So I thought maybe if I look at this subset of the data, I'll see them clustered at a, a smaller closeness index, but no. <laughs> so, the, I don't know what to say about why the Taiwan is having low VSS. It's one of two things. Either it, it's just low for that region or that this this approach of looking the path effects for some reason isn't working. But I have to look more into that. So uh, epistemic uncertainty of VSS. Uh, well, like Norm said earlier on, when we do this partially non-ergodic approach, uh, we need to estimate the site-to-site -site term and the TI team will, will need to do that, but we'll also need to consider the epistemic uncertainty around this site-to-site -site term. Another epistemic uncertainty that needs to be considered is around the single station fee. And one way we can do that is we can look at the single station fee at every station and, um, and see the distribution and their standard deviation. So this is, for example, for the California data. So we need to use um, a larger number of recordings per station. This is the VSSS, basically VSS at every station, their distribution. And if we, we want to assume that this is log normally distributed, we can get a mean and median VSS and this standard deviation, uh, which can inform our epistemic uncertainty. So, do I have more time? Okay. Another. Uh, thing we're trying to understand is, is, what is can the radiation pattern explain the high VSS for the California and Taiwan in this case for magnitude 3 to 5 and uh, short distances. So for California data we had uh, these uh, S-wave radiation coefficients in the flat file uh, that approximate the finite fold radiation pattern of the hypocenter for the Fn and Fp uh, components. But this was missing uh, for, for a lot of the data, particularly for the small magnitude data. So Doug here uh, did some uh, simulations and took these uh, small magnitude uh, uh, events and calculated um, uh, an effective radiation coefficient for this data set using Green's function for a central coast 1D model. So basically, this radiation coefficient is the ratio of the maximum amplitude at the station relative to the maximum amplitude over a ring at the, at the distance of that station. So this is uh, period independent, and this one too is period independent. So what I try to do is to plot the within event residuals versus this radiation pattern uh, and grouped by, by these magnitude distance ranges. So this is here for M325. The blue under this one is uh, distance 0 to 15 kilometers, and the red is 15 to 30 kilometers. And we can see some trend uh, of the residuals with, with the increasing the, the radiation coefficient. This is for magnitude 5 to 6 and 6 to 8, and not much trend is observed. So then I went and I binned these residuals and computed VSS in the different radiation coefficient pins. So um, you have here the dark blue is uh, M3 to 5 distance up to 15 kilometers. And we, we, we see this kind of ramp of uh, the VSS as the radiation coefficient increases up to 1. Uh, this other, um, another kind of blue here is the M3 to 5 distance 15 to 30 kilometers does not show such a strong um, trend. And then I'm 6 to 8 and, and 5 to 6 also don't show trend. Now this, I put this plot here just to remind us what we're kind of looking for. We're looking to explain this increase here. So I honestly don't know yet what this means. Um, I think that maybe it kind of explains some things, but I don't know if this is the whole story. So this is work in progress. If anybody has any ideas, you're welcome to speak. <laughs> Um, is this your last plot? Uh, no, have? but I, it's a similar Let's, one. Let's one second. Here you see more the radiation pattern impact at longer periods. But the interesting thing is when I bin them up, kind of the, I don't see pattern of VSS here, which I also don't see in the VSS uh, versus distance. Summary, that's it. Okay, so. 
Let's start with that, those last couple of plots, because I'm not sure I understand what, go yeah. back one more. Um, actually, let's go forward one. So the bottom plot is what we're trying to explain. Mm -hmm. And this large increase, right? Yes. And so my concern before had been numbers as high as 0 0.9 mm -hmm. compared to, let's say, 0 0.5. Yeah. If the standard deviation is going up that much, you must be adding variability that itself is 0.8 or something mm -hmm. like that, right? Yeah. Uh, it's a huge term. So now when you go to the neck, go back one, I guess it is, we're trying to look at I don't understand what you just did on the, on the top frame of the next plot. So here, you're trying to look at, yes, there's a slope, right? And, and how, much, um, how much that radiation pattern would be increasing the variability of phi SS. Mm -hmm. But what did you do on the so next I, one? What I did is I bent these residuals in different uh, 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 radiation coefficient bins, and I plotted them. And my hope was to see, like, magnitude, you know, R0 to 15 here, but then, but then, you know, R15 to 30 back. But, so go, go back one again. So I'm still a little trying to figure out what we're trying to show here. We want to know impact of radiation mm -hmm. pattern, but you're applying the standard deviation about the, the average line? So would it be about the blue line? Um. Because if there was a really steep slope, so radiation pattern was having a large effect, yeah. we could still have the same standard deviation and it's having a big effect. Really, I thought we want to look at the impact of the slope, slope. here. So this standard deviation is basically just the um, square root of these residuals divided by n. So it's, I don't take out the mean. Oh, so it's all about zero. Yeah, yeah right. it's about zero. OK, all right, so that, that helps. So part of this is if there was a steep slope, mm -hmm. and we talked the other day that that blue line would have to have a slope of uh, maybe three times what's yeah. shown there to, to really explain. to get to get it from radiation pattern. Yeah. But if you go to your next one now, so I, I know what you're doing. Mm -hmm. um, on the right-hand side, you're showing more variability when the radiation pattern should be high, yes. right? Meaning sometimes it's working and sometimes it's you know, yeah. off, or maybe we actually have the, the wrong radiation pattern in there because of, right, I'm not sure how accurate that is. Yeah, there's, there'll be uncertainty in the radi radiation pattern for the small events. Um, I guess the other factor, though, is, is the hypocentral coordinates in particular source depth. Yeah. Uh, but if we go back, the, the, if she's taking the square of the residuals with respect to zero. So if, if, the, if, if the whole thing is moved off, She's, you'll get a sigma from the bias. from the bias, so that would also increase the standard deviation. If that's what if that's what you're doing, then yeah, that's what I mean. that would that would improve. So she's getting the the, mean, the shift of the mean off of zero for that for the high radiation coefficient. Can we go to one second? I was going to say because it seemed like there was a, a very large slope. I guess go forward to um, it, from. It's definitely steeper. Mm -hmm. Yes. But, but, say also, you'll have the. But, but all the but the mean residual where all the data is is centered at zero, so you don't have the effect of the offset. And then as you move down. You have that there. So it's not. So the other one was centered where at high radiation coefficient it was off zero. And this one, it's not. Yeah, sorry to confuse you, but I'm also confused. Well, <laughs> this, is, this is a topic we need to try to understand. The radiation pattern was a very appealing idea, if that would um, get it. So this explains some of it. Some right? of it. I so we're, we're back to how much does your standard deviation go down 
if I did when that you, out. When you took that out, yeah, that's I, I guess. Yeah, I had done that kind of stuff. Yeah. So one of the comments or questions for all of our resource experts here, um, this picture on the bottom is, is something we have to try to understand why that standard deviation goes up so much at short distances for small magnitudes. Um, if it had been the other potential explanation was an error in the hypocenter location, which would have a bigger effect on the short distances, right? And that would, so if it was off by five kilometers, we might be able to start to make a, a large effect. Um, yeah. But I, it seemed like it was having to be off by more than what the reported errors are going to be in those things, right? Because they're going to be on the order of kilometers, do you think, on this? Or? For source step, several kilometers. So, what about Adrian? Can I see this in giant? Yeah, I have to say that. Uh, so, you have asked about the uh, Japan data from Adrian, and it, actually, Adrian is doing a lot of work using the Japanese data, and this is something that we will have in the next couple of months or so, right? I, I'll let Adrian speak for that. <laughs> So this time being here, uh, one of the issues with PGA is at short distances, it's dominated by very high frequencies, and at large distances, mm -hmm. it's dominated by lower frequencies. Lower frequencies uh, routinely show better radiation pattern than high frequencies. If you go to high frequencies, you're hard pressed to right. see radiation. But that would push us the other direction. Other cause, direction. Because we're thinking radiation pattern is going to then emphasize a larger variability than if it's all washed out. So we tried those ideas early on and, and they're pushing us the wrong way. Um, uh, yes. This is, this is, okay, this is a new to me, so I, I may have missed something here. The, uh, is this effect, did I see correctly, this is not seen at one second? Yes, that's right. So here is the plot. This is one second. And n not, I mean. So any radiation not, not pattern like a type of explanation would have to explain the difference between the high frequency and yes. low frequency. Or likewise, any uh, hypocentral distance yes. explanation. Yes. yes, exactly. Thank you, right. See that this, this tells us radiation pattern is likely not to, to do it for us. This, this feature was seen, though, with all of the GMPEs, right? All the GMPEs and for, for the Lilletal data, Taiwan, show the same thing. Are these the killer pulses? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> is it, yeah, magnitude threes. Uh, go ahead. To yeah, uh, a number of questions. So, so you see it. Uh, Gabe, yeah, Gabriel give Tor. your name. Gabriel Thor. Thank you. <laughs> I think my, my accent is recognized already, but anyway. <laughs> yeah, Linda. So you see this with the GMPs that use uh, JP distance as well? Uh, no, I don't have it actually. You don't have it. Because it could be the rupture distance just doesn't work well for, for these short distances. Okay. And, and it may be a matter of just looking at the yeah. residual very carefully. So part, one thing that might do it on depth is we have pretty strong depth scaling. And Z-Tor Z or hypocenter depth in, in the other one. So that emphasizes the hypocentral air. And I think that's getting back to what you're saying. Just we're moving things almost a factor of two for every 10 kilometers the hypocenter moves up and down. So especially for small earthquakes, some of them are really strong. So that might be driving. I think you need to almost run a simulation of errors in the hypocentral depth to see if we can produce that, assuming the models are right even in the way that they predicted the depth scaling. Because I don't think the distance changed from 10 to you know 12 kilometers or whatever the, the slope is, the slant distance will be is gonna be a large enough effect but that Z, the depth scaling may be what's blowing that up uh, at um, smaller magnitudes. Yeah. 
Is it good? But when Adrian and founded for Pegasus, were they using JB distance or using uh, rupture? Just one quick question. A couple, a couple of very quick questions. First, one thing we, oh, another thing we need to consider is that the duration of this motion is going to be very short and may contribute to the scatter. And second, uh, does this have any implications when you try to use small event data to empirically characterize your site terms? It makes it more difficult because there's more scatter. Yeah. Okay. But we don't think we're biased. So it's less informative. It's less informative. Okay. Right. And that's taken into account in the proceeding. Correct. Okay. That's that's part of the range of the sigma SSs or phi SSs that Linda was showing. So to answer, could you just give Adrian the microphone? Just describe what you did on the Pegasus work. We use we use closest distance in the Pegasus work, and we see the same trends only for small. We see distance dependence only from small magnitudes, except that. We only went down to magnitude four, so we didn't see it spike up as much. Um, Norm, you mentioned we could use simulations, but we, there, you can also use Bayesian methods in which you introduce uncertainty in depth and see how much of that takes away from the resulting PSA. Right, I, I think there's a bunch. One is just the size of the effect. Can we get there easily incorporating a couple of kilometers, you know, one, two, or three kilometers uncertainty in the depth. So you could do it formally with, with Bayesian approach, or she can just brute force run it and see, are we, at a, are we in the right ballpark here? Can you get the number up to 0.9, assuming the underlying variability was really a half? Because th this is all influencing us in terms of what do we do for larger magnitudes? One is to ignore that, but we, but we need to have a good explanation for why that effect should not be uh, addressed. But does it matter to the hazard? Because this is happening at magnitudes three to five. Yeah. No, it, it doesn't matter if we say <coughs> that only applies to small magnitudes and doesn't apply to big magnitudes, but we have a lot of data from these small magnitudes and not as much from the other ones, so I close in, so I think we really need to be, have a good reason to say this model is not uh, applicable to the high magnitudes. Okay, you need the microphone. And, and it also matters, as I said earlier, when you do empirical site-specific estimation on the site term, that is what to matter as well. Right, it, that influences your ability, your how much epistemic uncertainty you need and the, how many earthquakes you need to constrain it. So that has hazard implications. Correct. Okay. Right. Even though those events themselves don't contribute to the hazard. That right, especially, especially anytime you're using the smaller earthquakes in particular. Yusef? Yusef Buzornia. Yusef Buzornia. Adrian, for Japanese, you have magnitude 4 and above or 3? For Jap the Japanese data that I have worked on so far is only magnitude 4 and above. Oh. Okay. And we are now processing data down to magnitude 3, but that's not, we haven't done the analysis okay. yet. And then, Linda, two things. Uh, I gave you residuals for our model up to 80, but I have it up to 300 also, okay. so I can give yeah, it. Then other things that I noticed for NGFS2, so the uh, difference between phi and phi SS is about 0.17, something in that order, 0.15, something. Mm -hmm. But if I recall correctly, for NGFS1 was in order of 0.1 or so. Uh, do you recall? So, Norm, you did the NGFS1, or I did it, I don't know. I'm, I was trying to think of what I was going to write down. Say that again, Lisa. For the difference between PSS and phi in NGFS1, if I recall correctly, was close to 0.1. We now did, it's 0.17. We didn't do it as, we did it in terms of the total when we were reporting it. So sigma versus sigma SS, it was about 15% lower. Okay, but so, I was curious. 15% so of the value, so it's about 0.1 uh -huh. um, unit. So down. I was curious why we get uh, more reduction. Is it because of, we have more data? No, no. Phi, phi is going to come down more because we're going to add the tau term into it, right? But the difference in NGOS1 between phi and phi is, is was it order of 0.1? We didn't. 
Oh, you didn't? I didn't tabulate it that way. That's what oh, I'm trying to say. So I don't know that number. Oh, I see. Okay. Um, it, we have it reported as uh, um, an impact on the total segment because that's what we were scaling up. Okay. So if the total comes down by 0.1 natural log units, then the VSS must come down by more than that because we're going to be bringing the tau term along, right? Let's, Christine. So, yeah, you mix your girls. <laughs> so um, yesterday, actually, I had a discussion with John Ake about that and this whole issue of the larger sigmas at the small magnitude. I really think, well, Norm, we haven't talked about it yet, but at least for NGEs, we'd like to do simulations, like uh, like uh, uh, Gabe suggested, just basically on the on the randomizing maybe the magnitude and sampling that, and also the distance, because the uncertainty on those small events, I think, is probably what is driving that. And we'd like to compare yeah. that to what we observe. Right. But I think here it's not distance. I think it's depth because yeah, well, we have such a strong depth term. Exactly. Right? But the, the, you could the do effect, as well right, for that. Sure. Exactly. And I think that would be a really nice exercise to do just SMSM, run a bunch, and run statistics and see if it replicates what we see here instead of assuming a deterministic value. But she can just also take the. GMPEs oh, and yeah, propagate and change it through it. there yep. and then see would they be producing this same size of an effect. If that makes it work, then we can associate it with uh, the hypocentral the depth error and, and we have a reason for our, why that is limited to that size earthquake. Because if you're using a point source, then you have to assume some depth dependence model for stress drop. <laughs> Other comments? Adrian, did you have something else? Okay. Um, we're actually right on time, Linda, so uh, thank you. If there's nothing else for Linda, I think we, what we're set out is moving forward, we still have to figure out the explanation for yeah. this. But you're getting fairly robust numbers, at least between the GMPE values, yeah. right? Yeah. Can you put that back up? Just the, the GMPEs. The, the three approaches or models. Sorry. And you just haven't run BOR yet, is that? Yeah, right? I haven't done it because I, I didn't have much time, but I and I didn't have the residuals, but I'll get it. And Taiwan so is, is the Lin et al. Yeah, the Lin et al. Plus your additional residuals. Okay which don't make a lot of difference because they have most of the data. So the three to five is really similar yeah. other than Taiwan. Mm -hmm. And the five to six is still pretty good, so. So 0.4 to 0.5 in the mid-range, and then even 0.3 to 0.5 for the bigger earthquakes. All right, any last questions? Or Paul, can you pass the microphone to Paul? Uh, Norm, I'm wondering if the smart array data in Taiwan, which give information on spatial variation, might be of some use here. Could sort of help resolve whether there's different spatial coherency <coughs> issues in Taiwan compared with, say, California, that might affect this. Yeah, that's over really short right. separations. Right. Um, but it might give you some idea of how quickly things get incoherent, because that should affect maybe uh, one aspect of this issue. One aspect of yeah. So far, we've been using data from Taiwan at those short distances to move them to California, because we haven't had as much tight spacing. <laughs> I think Jack is going to talk a little bit about that on a larger scale, right? So when Jack is talking about um, Directivity is also going to be looking at this spatial correlation issue. And so let's think about that as well. Have you 
We'll wait till then, but if, if you've only looked at California or have you looked at different regions, okay? And that might be what we need to do. Adrian. I'm trying to understand what is the difference between Taiwan and California. Is Q more uniform in Taiwan than it is in California? We have seen the maps for Q for, for California. Are there similar studies for Taiwan? I don't know that answer. We have a couple folks from, um, Person Lin is actually here today, which is nice, but I don't know if you have any comments or know about Q models. Are there Q maps for Taiwan that are? We do have some Q study in Taiwan too. So maybe I can find out the reference for you to look at. Part of the issue I think is sampling the paths as well. And kind of what Linda was trying to get at was this closeness index, but that may not be capturing everything. If most of the paths are along the western side of the island, okay, you may have something that's much more uniform because there's more stations there and so forth, as opposed to paths that cross to the, through the mountains to the other side. So it might just be a more uniform sampling north-south that is dominating the data sets. We didn't look at sort of as musical variations that we're not seeing in California where we're having uh, more variability in the past. So this closeness index is, is our crude way of trying to avoid binning things up into cells, but it has a whole lot of other limitations that it's, it, or features it's not capturing. Yes. Linda, this is Jennifer Donahue. Uh, question for you. In one of the first slides that you showed, it looked like Taiwan was binned up about the same with Italy. Uh, so this is like, you know, pretty yeah. far at the beginning. Yeah. So yeah. I guess my question is, is, I don't know, is it easy to find that one? About uh, Italy. Yes. Uh, right. So the. Oh, you want to see that slide? Okay. Was so th this, it was kind of similar uh, sort of VSS for Italy. And the Italian data and norms model was also a lot of aftershocks. But I did not do, well, I kind of did the uh, closeness index plots for it. But I didn't really show it because there isn't that much data. So I just okay. concentrated on, on Taiwan. But yes, this is Italy here. OK, so it looks like they're basically following each other. So I was just wondering if maybe we're having the same problem with, with that data or it's just not showing up. So I think, I think you've answered my question. Yeah, yeah. OK. We, so Jennifer, we had speculated that because in this data set, a lot of them were aftershocks that they were just repeated paths coming yeah. through. So that was our, our first nice thought at it. Yeah. <laughs> Anything else for Linda? I have a question for Jai. Okay. So uh, Jai Anderson from uh, University of Nevada, Reno uh, online uh, asking, um, have you looked at any correlation between VSS and Kappa? Somehow it all goes back to Kappa, <laughs> unfortunately. No, I haven't. Does he have any ideas about that? that? Uh, a bigger, so um, Yusuf will probably tell us uh, we, what we need to get is Kappa for all of these stations, and that's a big effort. So. If John would ask that question in about two years, we probably will be able to address it. But until you have enough kappas in the data set, we can't start to get at that just yet. So. Yeah, and I think there, we, we probably see the kappa effect when we see the VS30 dependence. That increase, maybe due to variability in kappa, I don't know. Could be. Because we take out the uh, mean you've taken kappa. Out this, you've taken the site out, we so are. kappa should be gone from here, right? Yeah, but the variability? Um, the mean? I don't know. It's just a speculation. So I, what would a lower kappa lead to more variability? That's what you're, that's what you're speculating, right? The other way around, I mean, right? Uh, yeah, you're right. Lower, no, kappa, lower kappa, high, high yeah. so lower kappa is going to let more high frequencies through, and maybe there's more more yeah. variability that way. Um, I, I don't know. 
Does anyone else want to speculate or discuss the, the role of capital? I mean, there is clearly something going on here yeah. with an increase there, right? Yeah. Adrian didn't see the S30 pattern. Ken? Just an, an observation that uh, for the path effects, if you're, you're using this closest index, which is interesting, but it's possible that path effects another factor would be distance. So even if you have the same closest index, if you're 100 kilometers away versus 10 kilometers away, you know, you're, you do have, in fact, even though the, the path may be similar, but you, if there's errors along that path, they're going to accumulate or something. So I don't, know. It, I don't know if that's easy to test, but distance could be a, a factor. Oh, sorry, this is Ken Campbell. Yeah. <laughs> there's <laughs> clearly room to improve that parameterization of what would what the similarity of the past. All right, let's move on so we're um, trying to stay on schedule.